They feared the temptations of wealth. Yet a visitor once described their estate as the kind of place God would have built, if only he'd had the money. They amassed a fortune that outraged a democratic nation, then gave it away, reshaping America. They were the closest thing the country had to a royal family. But the Rockefellers shunned the public eye, retreating behind the walls of their palatial home at Pocantico, New York. My own personal experience as a child is of a place that on the one hand was something of an Eden, was serene and beautiful. As we grew up, a number of us began to experience Pocantico also as something of a prison that cut us off from the larger world. The family found themselves haunted by the controversy surrounding John D. Rockefeller, king of Standard Oil. Vilified as a ruthless predator, as evil incarnate, he had created an industrial empire and a personal fortune on a scale the world had never known. The great drama for the Rockefellers is to deal with the wealth, to deal with it as a physical fact, to deal with this, this fortune as growing day by day in a way they can't control it anymore. But also they have to deal with the fact of this money as a moral fact. How do you control it? How do you control yourself? In the drama of the Rockefellers, John D. Jr. was cast in an almost impossible role. He was the son of the most controversial businessman in America who had to figure out, by sheer force of character, a way to change the image and the direction of this family without openly repudiating this father he loved. In his quest for redemption and respectability, John D. Jr. would push his family to the pinnacle of American power. One of his sons would reach for the highest prize, the presidency, and provoke a new generation's rage and hostility. For more than a century, the Rockefellers' wealth and influence have attracted both attention and suspicion and threatened to tear the family apart. Why do we want to preserve this power? Why do we want to devote our lives to maintaining all these institutions that have been created by the family? Uh, what is the purpose of all of this? And I think for many of us, we came to realize that the real problem of life is the integration of power and goodness. October 9, 1901, the steam yacht Wild Duck sailed out of Providence, Rhode Island. On board was one of the richest men in America, John D. Rockefeller, and his family. The boat was bound for an estate at Warwick Neck on the west shore of Narragansett Bay. Soon the groomed lawns would welcome 500 guests, the lions of the Gilded Age. Outside the gates, reporters gathered, 
for the wedding of Rockefeller's only son, John Jr., and Abby Aldrich, daughter of a powerful Rhode Island senator. Pinkerton guards had been deployed to protect the bejeweled guests and glittering wedding presents. They had another, more dangerous assignment. John D. Rockefeller, founder of Standard Oil, was the most hated man in America, described as monstrous, evil, cruel. Rockefeller was hounded by reporters, stalked by strangers asking for money. He had taken to keeping a revolver by his bed. There had been kidnap threats against his family and letters warning of homemade bombs destined for the Rockefeller's house. This was a family under siege. It would fall to the new bride and to the dutiful, obedient son, already oppressed by the burdens of growing up a Rockefeller, to find a way forward for the family. century they called this part of upstate New York the burned over district burned not by fire but by fire and brimstone by the blaze of Christian revivalism preachers urged a life of hard work prayer and good deeds to build the kingdom of God on earth it was in the midst of this evangelical fervor that John Davison Rockefeller was born in 1839, the second of five children. His mother, Eliza Davison Rockefeller, was deeply religious, stern, disciplined. Even as a young woman, she had not been given to smiles and laughter. But she had this fatal moment of weakness one day when William Avery Rockefeller appeared on her doorstep peddling cheap trinkets. And he had a little slate that was uh, tied to his buttonhole. And on the slate, he had chalked, I am deaf and dumb. This was part of his con man routine. And Eliza, quite out of character, was immediately smitten by this charming rascal and, in fact, proclaimed in his presence, I'd marry him if he weren't deaf and dumb. He's a scoundrel apparently an enchanting scoundrel in person, and he certainly enchanted Eliza, and apparently enchanted a good many other women too, which is part of being a scoundrel. Unlike his devout wife, William Avery Rockefeller kept away from the church. He was a traveling man, a salesman who sold quack cures from a wagon out on the western frontier. People whispered about his footloose life. They called him Devil Bill. He would come and go as he pleased, never with advanced warning. He'd be away for months. There'd be credit at the store. One winter, he ran up a bill in one store of $1,000. In the 19th century, that's an enormous sum of money. But then he would come back, most frequently at night, so people would never know where he came from. And he would tell stories of his exploits that were never quite complete enough to pin him down as to what he had done or where he had done it. Devil Bill's laughter and music flooded the house. He would be fingering wads of cash, wearing fancy new clothes. He once appeared with a patchwork tablecloth made out of banknotes. I had a peculiar training in my home, John Dee observed of his childhood. It seemed to be a business training from the beginning. Bill Rockefeller admitted to one of his neighbors, I do business deals with my sons and I always try to cheat them. 
to make them sharp. Now, John Dee did not always like those lessons in business, but he absorbed them. His father lent him money, always at the prevailing interest rate, then deliberately called in the loans without warning to make sure his son had kept reserves. With Devil Bill, John Dee discovered the excitement of taking a big risk, the allure of cold cash. Eliza taught him the sober habits of her Christian faith, thrift, hard work, and perfect self-control. He was like a little adult. When he went to school, students talked about him being Mr. Serious. And although he had a wonderful sense of humor that was very sly, for the most part, he behaved very uh, rigidly even and, and liked things orderly the way his mother did. Things occurred according to schedules. And there was a reward for good behavior and there was a sacrifice for bad behavior. In 1849, the world fell apart for the Rockefeller family. Bill was accused of the rape of a maid he had hired to work in the household. Rather than confront the charges, he fled, leaving the family alone to face the scandal. It was a moment of intense shame for 10-year-old John. And I think that it was in the face of the malicious tongues of village gossips that uh, John D. Rockefeller developed this very wary, secretive, self-reliant uh, nature because people were always whispering about his father and John D. himself would not have known the truth of his father but I think that he felt that he would face down the village gossips by developing this very hard and stoic air. Eliza and her five children found refuge in the local Baptist church. Each Sunday, when the collection plate was passed around, she urged young John to contribute his few pennies. He came to associate the church with charity. A Baptist preacher once encouraged him to make as much money as he could, then give away as much as he could. It was at this moment, Rockefeller later recalled, that the financial plan of my life was formed. But the sound of coins in the collection plate still had the distant ring of Devil Bill. John D. came to associate money with those rare times that father came home flush with cash from the, the road and that the Rockefellers briefly functioned as a real family. And I think the fact that John D. grew up in this perpetually insecure situation, wondering whether when father would come home, wondering if they would pay off the credit at the, uh, the general store, created a person who had an abnormal need, not only for a large amount of money, but for constant security. And somebody who disliked surprises, somebody who wanted to master chance and outwit fate. Fate delivered John D. one more bitter surprise. He soon discovered that his father had taken a second wife under an assumed name. Shielding his mother from the shame, John kept the bigamy a secret. To carry on his double life, Bill moved the family to Cleveland. Then he disappeared again, leaving them alone in the new city. And this turned relations between John Dee and his father stone cold. I think in the long run, it had the effect of leading John Dee to decide to make a life for himself that was as different from his father's as he could manage without quite abandoning things that he still thought of value in what his father had taught him, like business. John had hoped to go to college. Now he dropped out of high school and started looking for work to help support the family. 
I did not go to any small establishments, he recalled. I was after something big. He found a job as an assistant bookkeeper, but threw himself into it with missionary intensity. As soon as he starts working, there's nothing lighthearted or carefree about this young 16-year-old boy. He closely reviews every bill and uh, jumps on errors of even a few pennies in the bill. He's amazed at the laxity and inefficiency of these much older bosses who are much more experienced. And I think that that was the thing that distinguished Rockefeller from an early age. Not so much brilliant, flashing intelligence, but this thorough, plodding, systematic way that he did things. John began to keep a ledger, noting every expenditure, large and small. For him, numbers were sacred. John Dee's ledger took on a special role of being a kind of conscience, I would say. He recorded his contributions to various causes, to church, every penny that he gave to a poor little girl he saw on the street, to abolitionist causes. And he would use this throughout his life as a way of evaluating himself. Line upon line, as his earnings grew, his ambition quickened. He borrowed $1,000 from Devil Bill, with interest, and plunged into the risky business of commodity trading, buying and selling meat and grain. He was just 18. Only a year later, the something big he was looking for surfaced in the backwoods of Pennsylvania. Oil, to grease the wheels of America's infant industries. Oil, to fuel an explosion of growth. News of the discovery unleashed pandemonium as thousands of speculators descended upon the region. Overnight, wildcatters stripped away whole forests and put up thousands of rickety derricks, hoping to strike black gold. As the oil gushed skyward, fantastic stories appeared of instant fortunes. Among the Cleveland businessmen lured to was John D. Rockefeller. He was no wildcatter. He saw that drilling for oil was a very risky business. Refining, not drilling, he decided, was where the steady money was to be made. Soon, a new rail line linked Cleveland with the oil region. Rockefeller built his refinery right beside it. It was one of the first in the city to produce kerosene, a new fuel for lamps that was cheap and clean. The poor man's light, as John D. called it, would bring a brilliant glow into American homes. The soaring demand for it, he was convinced, would make him rich. I shall never forget how hungry I was in those days, he later wrote. I ran up and down the tops of freight cars. I hurried up the boys. Obsessed with the business of oil, he mastered every detail, developed new products to sell. By age 25, his refinery was one of the largest in the world. He really mortgaged his life up to the hilt. He borrowed tens of thousands of dollars, which is the equivalent, of course, of millions today. He had the strength of this vision that this was where his destiny was, and this is where the destiny of this country was. The country was going to kind of ride to, to greatness on this tidal wave of oil. And he constantly felt that he would inevitably triumph in some fundamental way. He honestly believed that he had a calling to make money. 
and that it was a gift that had been bestowed upon him by God, just as some people could sing opera and other people could paint beautifully. He had a particular aptitude for acquiring wealth, and he considered it a God-given gift. John Dee tended his faith as carefully as his business. As a lowly clerk, he paid for a slave's freedom and gave to a Catholic orphanage. As he grew rich, his donations grew more generous, especially for his church in Cleveland. He falls in love with this church. He sweeps the chapel. He rings the bell. He lights the candles. He teaches in the Sunday school. He seems to find in the church a refuge from the sort of sin that he has encountered with his father. Soon, John was drawn to a young woman as devout and determined as he was. Laura Spellman was an 1840s, 1850s feminist. She was the valedictorian of her high school graduating class, uh, the same class that John Dee was in. And the title of her address was, I Can Paddle My Own Canoe. And it was a plea for women's suffrage in 1855. When John courted her, it was very different from the other young men of her set who were also after her, who would see her at balls and parties. He'd come to her house, and they might play a little piano together. But then they would often sit down with his ledger books and go over them together. And she apparently found them just as interesting as he did. On September 8, 1864, John and Laura were married in a small private ceremony. My great-grandmother was a figure who perhaps had a bit of Helen Brimstone in her philosophy, who basically believed through deeds you go to heaven, uh, and therefore you could very likely go to hell if you weren't uh, properly motivated and, 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 and properly achieving. Like his devout mother, Laura strengthened John's sense that he was doing God's work, not only in church, but also in business. Rockefeller's future, however, was harnessed to an industry in trouble. So many wells were flowing, he lamented, that the price of oil kept falling, yet they went right on drilling. He saw an industry plagued by overproduction, and his own success threatened by what he described as ruinous cutthroat competition. John Dee was shrewd enough and he was analytical enough that he realized that in order to figure out a way to save his own firm and his own newly won fortune, that he had to figure out a solution for the entire industry. It was at that point that John Dee began to conceive of the oil industry as one big interrelated mechanism. And you couldn't just change one component, you had to control the entire machine. In a move that would transform the American economy, Rockefeller set out to replace a world of independent oil men with a giant company controlled by him. In 1870, begging bankers for more loans, he formed Standard Oil of Ohio. The next year, he quietly put what he called our plan, his campaign to dominate the volatile oil industry into devastating effect. Rockefeller knew that the refiner with the lowest transportation cost could bring rivals to their knees. He entered into a secret alliance with the railroads called the South Improvement Company. In exchange for large, regular shipments, Rockefeller and his allies secured transport rates far lower than those of their bewildered competitors. Ida Tarbell, the daughter of an oil man, later remembered how men like her father struggled to make sense of events. 
an uneasy rumor began running up and down the oil regions, she wrote. Freight rates were going up. Moreover, all members of the South Improvement Company, a company unheard of until now, were exempt. Nobody waited to find out his neighbor's opinion. On every lip, there was but one word, and that was conspiracy. What it really represented was the face of monopoly. It immediately became clear that the entire nature of the enterprise was going to change in ways that spelled their doom. And so there was a shock of recognition that they were going to be left behind and that a whole world that had been opened up to them was soon to close. The image that was always used was that of the anaconda, the squeezing python-like grips of uh, this economic snake that was just taking individual entrepreneurs and just putting them out of business and reducing them to kind of economic straight where they had no alternative but to really to sell out, to sell out to the principles in this conspiracy. It was a conspiracy, really. It was one of the first great economic conspiracies in this country. In an effort to thwart the scheme, many independents refused to sell crude oil to Rockefeller and his associates. Undaunted, Rockefeller used the threat of the South Improvement Company to intimidate his rival refiners in Cleveland. His brother and business partner, William, characterized the plan as war or peace, sell out to Standard Oil or suffer the consequences. At first, they approached their targets with deference and flattery. Rockefeller himself used his own considerable talent for persuasion, presenting Standard Oil as a brotherhood based on cooperation. He had this missionary faith that he was destined to guide this industry. And when he took over his rivals, he not only wanted their plans, he often wanted the managers. So it was not in his interest to alienate them. He much preferred convincing people to sell to him voluntarily rather than trying to squeeze them through paratactics. Although if necessary, he would resort to very rough methods in order to soften them up, or he used a phrase to give them a good sweating before he negotiated with them. Rockefeller might create a shortage of the railroad tank cars that transported oil. He might go out and buy up all the barrels on the market, so a competitor would have no place to store his oil or ship it. He would even buy up all the available chemicals that were necessary to refine oil. Rockefeller instructed Standard Oil men to communicate in code. The company was nicknamed Club. John D. Rockefeller was referred to as Chowder. Many of Rockefeller's targets had no idea that the local refiners who were slashing prices and acting like competitors were actually part of Rockefeller's growing empire. In just two months, he had taken over 22 of the 26 Cleveland refineries, revealing the single-minded drive that would make him both the wonder and the terror of American business. Nobody knew what he sounded like. Nobody heard him. Um, he walled himself off. And, and the people who did know him, though, the people who did find him ruthless, uh, had reason to find him ruthless, because you come up against someone who has no self-doubts, who has a vision, and who has no qualms about achieving that vision, because he doesn't think he's doing wrong. Once he made his mind up, you might as well sell your company, because it was going to be part of Standard Oil. Methodically, secretly, John D. Rockefeller was doing more than transforming a single industry. He was changing forever the way America did business. The day of combination is here to stay, he declared. Individualism has gone, never to return.
By 1879, when Rockefeller is 40, he controls 90% of the oil refining in the world. Within a few years, he will control 90% of the marketing of oil and a third of all of the oil wells. So this very young man controls what is not only a national but an international monopoly in a commodity that is about to become the most important strategic commodity in the world economy. Rockefeller relished time spent with Laura. After the birth of their first child, Elizabeth, they moved to Euclid Avenue, Cleveland's Millionaire's Row. Although Rockefeller could have afforded any mansion on the street, he deliberately picked a more modest house, where his three remaining children were born, Alta, Edith, and his only son, John Jr. Convinced that riches led to sin, Rockefeller, now one of America's richest men, faced a difficult task in raising his children. They seemed a bit afraid of this wealth, and they felt they should continue to live as they had in the past, with very simple wardrobe, children sharing toys, children earning allowances, that this was an important part of building character and continuing the virtuous life that to in some way give in to too much luxury would lead one astray laura compelled young john to wear his sister's remade hand-me-downs until he was eight she once proudly confided to a neighbor i am so glad my son has told me what he wants for christmas so now it can be denied him. After she was diagnosed with consumption, the Rockefellers began to spend more time at Forest Hill, their 79-acre estate outside of Cleveland. Despite its grand facade, he insisted the interior remain bare of all signs of luxury or pretension. Money, Junior recalled, was something there, like air or food or any other element. Yet it was never easily attainable. In the setting where all this frugality and restraint was practiced in the household, he was surrounded by hundreds of acres of um, gardens, uh, lakes where they could uh, ice skate. Uh, every outer manifestation of wealth and then in the intimate family setting, he was being raised like a poor little kid. To earn pocket money, Junior mended doors, killed flies, and sharpened pencils, dutifully keeping track of every penny in a ledger, just like his father. He attended prayer meetings and recited temperance slogans without complaint. By age 10, he had signed a solemn oath that he would abstain from tobacco, profanity, and the drinking of any intoxicating beverages. Junior and his sisters were constantly pushed by their mother to cleanse their souls of sin. Every Sunday afternoon, Laura would sit down with the children and they would discuss their, what she called their ill-conceived actions of the week. And that was, were the besetting sins. And the, the idea was to examine what they did and basically ask forgiveness and analyze how they could improve their behavior for the next week. The most important lesson that she taught the children was what is your duty? And that is what is to guide your life. Service to others. You are not here just for your own enjoyment or even just simply to pray. You have a purpose beyond that. Laura was the disciplinarian in the family, and John D. Sr., a doting, cheerful, indulgent father, he plays with his children, his son, teaches them to skate. When they're a little older, he ties a white handkerchief to the back of his belt, and he leads 
the kids on bicycle chases across his estate. Rockefeller led his children through the winding roads at Forest Hill, revealing a boyish excitement that few outsiders ever saw. He loved to play games, electrifying the children with daring feints, sudden thrusts, and unexpected wheeling turns, followed by whoops of delight when he won. Junior recalled, Father never told us what not to do. He was one with us. Although Rockefeller was a merry companion for his children, he and Laura kept them cut off from the outside world. We went rarely, practically not at all, to neighbors' houses, John Jr. remembered. No childhood friends, no school friends. The austerity drilled into John D. by his mother Eliza still reigned in the Rockefeller family. At age 76, immobilized by a stroke, she died with her eldest son at her side. She never knew her husband had taken a second wife. Rockefeller expected his estranged father to attend the funeral. When Devil Bill failed to show, it was the last straw. The day before Eliza's funeral, John D. instructed the preacher to describe his mother as a widow. This was part of his revenge. He was editing his father out of existence. And he never forgave his father. And he distinctly left the impression with people in subsequent years that his father was dead. In 1883, Rockefeller moved his family to New York, the center of America's burgeoning industrial economy. The King of Standard Oil now set out to transform his company into something bigger and more powerful than anything the world had ever seen. Rockefeller reigned over a patchwork of companies, cumbersome to manage. He was looking for a way to skirt a law that then prohibited combining the operations of businesses in different states. His solution was to have stockholders in 40 companies secretly trade in their shares for certificates in a standard oil trust. The trust became a corporation of corporations. Rockefeller had devised an ingenious legal shield. Behind it, he could command his vast business empire, smoothly and in complete secrecy. In 1885, he moved Standard Oil into an imposing granite fortress near Wall Street. 26 Broadway soon became the world's most famous business address. It was also a hated symbol of a monopoly so powerful that no law seemed able to control it. Small businessmen, middle-class Americans, people who were independent, who were used to believing that hard work and determined effort was the way to success, looked at corporations like the Standard Oil with their unprecedented size and felt afraid and so feeling ran extremely high and the hostility was intense. Rockefeller saw himself as a prophet of a new order. He called it cooperation. His critics called it monopoly. His company would be the world's first great multinational corporation, efficient and stable, with vast economies of scale. During the first 20 years of Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller managed to lower the price of kerosene from 23 cents a gallon to 7 cents a gallon, and he managed to improve the quality of the product at the same time. He was a monopolist. 
He was a rough and often unscrupulous monopolist, but he was also a very smart and enterprising businessman. There was nothing complacent about him, and it was one of the ways that he was able to justify these rough methods to himself. Rockefeller had wanted to remain invisible, but he wielded such power that he became a magnet for suspicion. Hearings, investigations, and lawsuits began to challenge the Standard Oil Empire. John Dee was called to testify in one forum after another. He was a kind of difficult witness to kind of pin down, because on the one hand, he was verbally fairly clever, actually, and keen in, in terms of his ability to kind of listen to the questions. When he was being investigated about the South Improvement Company, for instance, one interrogator said something about the Southern Improvement Company, and he seized upon that misnomer to say, and John Dee said, I wasn't part of that. One reporter described 26 Broadway as a cave for pirates, a den for the cutthroats of commerce. Reporters who eluded the security guards encountered doors with special locks. The trick was to twist the rim with thumb and forefinger before turning the knob. If a trespasser did not know the secret, he could find himself trapped between locked doors. Half of America seemed willing to lynch Rockefeller. The other half wanted a loan. He received on average 50 to 60,000 letters a month asking for help. Uh, dozens of people followed him in the street. Uh, literally, uh, crowds stood around uh, the Standard Oil offices waiting for him to come out, you know, uh, little children, painfully thin, you know, crying in the street and so on. Uh, Rockefeller felt overwhelmed. By 1889, John D. pegged his fortune at more than $40 million. He had always been a generous man, but at the same time, loathed to waste a penny. He hired Reverend Frederick Gates, a Baptist minister, to help him forge a new set of principles for philanthropy. Senior began very seriously to rethink not just the vehicles, but the purposes of charity. Charity as a way of remaking society and not ameliorating evil. So cure a scarlet fever. Don't provide another scarlet fever ward in a children's hospital. Um, find a more productive way of growing corn rather than making a soup kitchen. Uh, he was ahead of his time then, he still is. In the coming years, Rockefeller would fund the education of black women at Spelman College in Atlanta. Found the University of Chicago, the Midwestern equivalent of the Ivy League. Support groundbreaking medical research and public health campaigns. Frederick Gates pushed him on, warning, Mr. Rockefeller, your fortune is rolling up like an avalanche. You must distribute it faster than it grows. If you do not, it will crush you and your children and your children's children. Already strained by the demands of making money, Rockefeller now staggered under the new pressures of giving it away. Investigated and worked myself almost to a nervous breakdown, he said, in groping my way through the ever-widening field of philanthropic endeavor. Suffering from chronic stomach problems, Rockefeller took time off from work and retreated to Forest Hill. To regain his health, he worked outdoors, rode his bike, and ate simply. By the end of the summer, he had gained 15 pounds. Still, he resisted returning to work, 
and now contemplated something unthinkable, retirement. Here he was this wealthy person with great power. And in his mid-50s, he gave it all up. Now, in the history, I've never seen anybody do anything like that and then be happy without it, see. He, incredible wholeness and self-sufficiency, see. Power, money, status, position were no longer important to him. In 1897, John D. Rockefeller retired from Standard Oil, keeping the presidency in name only. No public announcement was made. Few Americans realized that the man they believed responsible for running the most powerful corporation on earth had surrendered the reins. When asked why Rockefeller retained the president's title, one senior director explained, he had to keep it. Cases against us were pending in the courts, and we told him that if any of us have to go to jail, he would have to go with us. As the only son and heir, John D. Rockefeller Jr. carried a heavy burden. From an early age, he had been taught that the responsibilities of the family fortune and name would be his to bear. By age 18, he had suffered two nervous collapses. John D. Rockefeller Jr. has some really rather impossible tasks ahead of him because by the time he comes of age, his father has been successful beyond anybody's wildest dreams, including his own, uh, to the point where the son cannot possibly match the father. Moreover, he's certainly familiar with the proverb of those to whom much has been given, much shall be required. And by the time he comes into his own, he realizes he's been given more than anybody else. So, of course, from him shall be required more than anybody else. Intensely conscientious, Junior entered Brown University in September 1893. He still wrote all his expenses down in a ledger and mended his own clothes. Slowly, however, he began to wean himself from his strict upbringing. For the first time in his life, he went to the theater, enjoyed football games, and even once smoked a pack of cigarettes. To the horror of his mother, he learned to dance. Soon he met Abby Aldrich, a popular Providence girl, undaunted by his name or his money. Abby Aldrich, because she was raised in a liberated, relaxed, artistic family, was like an injection of, of dynamism and, and interest in the larger world which John had been shielded from. Abby's father, Nelson Eldridge, was a controversial United States Senator from Rhode Island. He was fiercely criticized by the press for being the prime power broker of the great trusts. Junior admired Abby's ability to be loyal to her father and ignore the criticism he attracted. As he approached graduation, he still worshipped his own father and was deeply wounded by relentless attacks in the press. In 1897, fresh out of college, Junior went to work for Standard Oil. My one thought from the time I was a boy, he recalled, was to help my father. When he got there, nobody bothered to tell him how he was expected to help. He was given a desk, he was given a salary, he was given some miscellaneous chores, but nobody told him what was expected of him. 
he had to find out for himself where his place in the world was. And perhaps that's what Senior had in mind, was letting him find his own way. But in this case, it made life more difficult for the son. Anxious to succeed at something, Junior tried investing. He trusted the advice of a shady Wall Street speculator. Suddenly, cautious Junior lost $1 million of his father's money. He went to see his father with what must have been a terrible churning sensation in his stomach. His father reacted very patiently. John D. Sr. asked him a lot of questions. And instead of in any way scolding or reprimanding him at the end, says, all right, John, I'll take care of it. He saw that his son was flagellating himself about this incident and that there was no need punishing a son who was so clearly punishing himself. Fearing the family's vast fortune would overwhelm his son, Senior begged Junior to relax. Laura, however, pushed him forward. You are the son of the King of Kings, she reminded him, and so you can never do what will dishonor your father or be disloyal to the king. Junior anguished over whether to marry Abby and for four years prayed every day for divine guidance. Gently, his mother ended his agony, saying, of course you love Miss Aldrich. Why don't you go at once and tell her so? That fall, the freewheeling Senator Aldrich invited guests to an extravagant wedding. In private yachts, the elite of Gilded Age society descended on his Rhode Island estate. Many in the press saw this union of money and political power in dark terms. One reporter warned, the chief exploiter of the American people is now closely allied by marriage with the chief schemer. For the austere, controlled Rockefellers, Junior's new wife would be a liberating influence. When they're first married and Junior says, well, you'll have to keep a ledger, she just says, no, I won't. And when he gives her $1,000 as a wedding present, a rather interesting act in itself, she gives it to the YWCA in Providence. So immediately, you see she's going to assert herself. Abby joined the Rockefellers as they were about to enter the most painful moment in their history. Her husband would soon find himself in the harsh light of public scrutiny, alongside his father. When John D. was in his 50s, his hair started to fall out and his mustache began to fall out. And suddenly in 1901, all of his body hair fell out, not just from his head, all over his body. And this was a very crushing uh, and humiliating thing to suffer from because when you see photographs of him completely bald in the early 1900s, he looks like he could be in his 70s or 80s. Rockefeller had looked forward to the end of his long career. But now, the scandal surrounding his rise to power would be resurrected in haunting detail. Rockefeller and Standard Oil were about to be investigated by a vigorous new president, Theodore Roosevelt, and an increasingly assertive press. In 1901, the managing editor of McClure's magazine, Ida Tarbell, decided to research America's most secretive businessman. She began her investigation with an emotional journey back to Pennsylvania, where oil men like her father and brother had fought Standard Oil. Here she talked with legions of Rockefeller enemies. The task confronting me is a monstrous one, she wrote. I dream of the octopus day and night and can think of nothing else. 
When Ida Tarbell started writing the series, Rockefeller didn't realize how powerful the press had become in an age when Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst had mass newspaper chains. Didn't realize the new sophistication of muckrakers like Ida Tarbell, who were capable of taking a very complex subject, slicing it open, and really dissecting a person's life or an institution. In 1902, Tarbell's revelations gripped the nation. She brought to life a drama in which independent oil men were crushed by the mighty Standard Oil. She documented the monopoly's collusion with the railroads, the kickbacks and shady dealings. She exposed the sweatings and crushings, the spies and codes, the secret ownership of supposed rivals. There was not a lazy bone in the organization, not an incompetent hand or stupid head, she wrote. But they had never played fair, and that ruined their greatness for me. Because the series was such a great success and the circulation of McClure's kept jumping up, they allowed the series to run to 19 installments and what happened with each installment was not only did the audience grow larger and Teddy Roosevelt was avidly reading it and writing fan letters to uh, Ida Tarbell a lot of new sources were coming out of the woodwork um, as it uh, went on and so that there was a tremendous crescendo and the public kept getting angrier and angrier at Rockefeller President Theodore Roosevelt denounced him as a lawbreaker Novelist Leo Tolstoy cried out that no honest man should work with him. Rockefeller was called a pirate, a buccaneer, a robber baron. He received torrents of abusive mail, even death threats. Still, he refused to answer any of the charges leveled against him. From his mother's silence in the face of family scandal, he had learned as he put it, to let the world wag. I think if he had responded early to the Tarbell series, the wave of, of um, press and political denunciation might have subsided a bit. But you know, Senior knew that he could respond to some things in the series and say that's just not true. But he also knew that there were plenty of other things that were true. <laughs> about the rebates, about the bribing, and so on. So um, I think he probably, in the end, knew that he had no choice. Tarbell traveled to Cleveland to glimpse the Titan at one of his rare public appearances at the Euclid Avenue Baptist Church. There was an awful age in his face, she observed the oldest man I have ever seen. Mr. Rockefeller may have made himself the richest man in the world, but he has paid. Nothing but paying ever plows such lines. Tarbell described Rockefeller's agitated behavior, the way he was searching the aisles for possible enemies. Mr. Rockefeller, she concluded, for all his conscious power, was afraid afraid of his own kind. She then capped the 19-part series with a two-part character study where she described Rockefeller as hideous and leprous in appearance. And that actually wounded him much more than her expose of his business methods. He felt that it was very unfair to have portrayed him in this ghoulish fashion and to make the fact that he had lost all his hair somehow proof of his depravity. I didn't, Tarbell really took a toll on the family. John Jr. certainly uh, had what could only be described as a, as a really catastrophic nervous breakdown. Senior had serious, continuous stomach ailments. His wife was ill. So I think that the whole family, not just Senior, was reacting to what they saw as a body blow. Isolated and discouraged, John D. Rockefeller Jr. confided to his Bible class, 
I've never had more occasion to seek the sympathy of friends. All the money in the world will not take the place of friends. Riches, the young heir warned his pupils, breed but sin. This must have been an especially distressing period because as he's working at Standard Oil, he has a lot of contact with his father's hand-picked successor, John D. Archbold, who's engaged in an enormous amount of political corruption. And so I think that the Tarbell series is especially distressing because he wants desperately to believe in his father's innocence, and yet he's increasingly disturbed at 26 Broadway by the sordid atmosphere of standard oil, which meant that on some level he must have suspected that a lot of these things were true. Adrift at Standard Oil, Junior threw himself into building a new home for his father. Located at Pocantico Hills, 30 miles north of New York City, the site was called Kaikit, Dutch for lookout. It had a panoramic view of the Hudson River. Soon it became a haven for the family. Outside its walls, reporters gathered, demanding answers. For Junior, facing a hostile public became increasingly difficult as he and Abby began to have children. Their daughter, Abby, nicknamed Babs, was soon followed by John D. Rockefeller III, who was heralded as the richest baby in history. Newspapers gloated that the Titan could not visit his first grandson because of fear he would be served with a subpoena. With a rash of lawsuits now pending against Standard Oil, Rockefeller began leading the life of a fugitive, keeping his whereabouts secret. Kaikit became both his prison and fortress, surrounded by Pinkerton guards. As the Tarbell series drew to its close, the federal government announced sweeping antitrust indictments against Standard Oil. Senior was determined to carry on, confident in his own rectitude. Junior could not. Here was the son of the most controversial businessman in America who had to figure out, by sheer force of character, a way to change the image and the direction of this family without openly repudiating this father he loved. He had to be both loyal to his father and loyal to his principles at the same time, even though his principles often differed from those of his father. In 1910, John D. Rockefeller, Jr. decided to retire from the Standard Oil Trust and devote himself exclusively to helping his father give away the family fortune. With Junior at his side, Senior launched the Rockefeller Foundation, endowed with $100 million. Its ambitious goal was to promote the well-being of mankind throughout the world. Other people may have had trouble reconciling senior as the greatest philanthropist of his age i think what's important to note is that senior never had a moment's worry the notion that he gave away hundreds of millions of dollars to assuage guilt is is nonsense the notion that junior became a great philanthropist because of worry and guilt not so easy to call <laughs> junior was uh, a man plagued by self-doubt On May 15, 1911, the Supreme Court of the United States declared that Standard Oil was a monopoly in restraint of trade and should be dissolved. Rockefeller heard of the decision while golfing at Kaikit with a priest from the local Catholic Church, Father J.P. Lennon. 
And Rockefeller reacted with amazing aplomb. He turned to the Catholic priest and said, Father Lenin, have you some money? And the priest was very startled by the question and said, no. And then um, he said, why? And Rockefeller replied, by Standard Oil. As Rockefeller foresaw, the individual Standard Oil companies were worth more than the single corporation. In the next few years, their shares doubled and tripled in value. By the time the reign of cash was over, Rockefeller had the greatest personal fortune in history, nearly 2% of the American economy. And it was really losing the antitrust case that converted John D. Rockefeller into history's first billionaire. So that Standard Oil was punished in the federal antitrust case, but John D. Rockefeller Sr. most assuredly was not. Rockefeller's lucky streak was not over yet. Just as the electric light bulb threatened to wipe out the need for kerosene, the automobile appeared. The market for gasoline sparked euphoria in the oil industry. Rockefeller's soaring fortunes made it seem as if he had outwitted his critics again. Increasingly genial and relaxed, he cast off his business suit and experimented with a variety of wigs. He delighted in the birth of Junior's second son, Nelson, born on Senior's birthday. Three more boys followed, Lawrence, Winthrop, and David. With the furor over Standard Oil subsiding and the philanthropies launched, Junior was determined to give his children an inheritance they could be proud of. But his hopes of redeeming the family name were about to be shattered. In the fall of 1913, beneath the majestic peaks of the Rockies, a labor dispute was engulfing the coal mines of southern Colorado. It would engulf the Rockefellers as well, making the family once again the target of national outrage. The explosion came on September 23rd in the foothills near Ludlow. 8,000 miners struck a Rockefeller-owned company, Colorado Fuel and Iron, demanding more humane living and working conditions. CF and I immediately evicted the strikers from their homes. Families were forced to move into a makeshift tent colony beyond company grounds. The striking miners came from 32 different countries. Some thought John D. Rockefeller was the president of the United States. As both sides braced for a showdown, CF and I brought in gunmen and had them deputized by county sheriffs. Union organizers descended upon Colorado, including the fiery Mother Jones, who led a protest on the state's capital. In December, four feet of snow fell on southern Colorado. 20,000 men, women, and children shivered on the windswept plain. With no end to the stalemate in sight, John D. Rockefeller Jr. was summoned to testify before Congress. Although he was a company director, he said he knew little of the situation and had put his faith in the managers on the scene. Then he declared his faith in the open shop, the right not to join a union. An approving senior rewarded his son with 10,000 shares of CF and I stock. Senior was no friend of labor unions. And Junior goes along without really thinking about it, without realizing that it is damaging the men who were working for him, and without thinking about what it's doing to those communities, and without realizing what it can do to him. On the morning of April 20th, 
two weeks after Junior's testimony, a company of 35 National Guardsmen stationed themselves on a hill overlooking the tent colony in Ludlow. When a shot rang out from an unknown location, the guardsmen began raking the camp with machine gun fire, and a pitched battle began. Trapped families sought shelter from the bullets in dirt bunkers hidden beneath the tents. The cries of frightened children pierced the din of battle. At dusk, when the southbound local rumbled into Ludlow, families who had been trapped in terror seized the opportunity to escape behind the barrier of 36 freight cars. As the train pulled away, the brakeman reported seeing the tent colony engulfed by flames, lit, he claimed, by the torch of a soldier. The extent of the tragedy came to light the next morning. In a bunker beneath one of the tents, the bodies of two women and 11 children were discovered. The New York Times reported they had suffocated like trapped rats, more terrified by the bullets which whistled above their heads than the flames. Accounts differed, but the massacre had claimed at least 24 lives. Scores more were injured and burned. To many, there was no doubt who bore responsibility. For the first time, the full weight of public opinion descended directly upon Junior's shoulders. Here was John D. Rockefeller Jr., who was earnestly trying to redeem the family name, who was trying to distance himself from the family's corporate past and all these unscrupulous actions that his father had been accused of. And suddenly he's being accused of something far worse than anything that his father had been accused of, which was complicity in the deaths of Ludlow. Angry pickets marched in front of Junior's home and his office at 26 Broadway. Speakers urged mobs to shoot him down like a dog. Novelist Upton Sinclair publicly indicted Junior with the charge of murder. Radical workers threatened to storm the locked gates of Kaikat. This especially rattled Junior, whose mother, Laura, lay inside the walls close to death. Then, a homemade bomb exploded in a tenement, killing four radicals. It was believed to be destined for Junior's townhouse. But by December 1914, the miners' relief funds were exhausted. They were forced to return to work. It appeared to many as if management had won. But not to John D. Rockefeller, Jr., John D. Jr. saw I could have the blood of these people on me and my children for a generation. And to his credit, he eventually saw that he had to take a hand not only in, in cooling out that situation in Colorado and making it right, but that he had a duty in some sense to regularize this unruly, turbulent field of worker relations in America. One of the first signs of Junior's transformation came when he was summoned to testify before a government commission investigating the strike. On his way in, he stopped to shake hands with Mother Jones. I have never believed that you knew what those hirelings out there were doing, Mother Jones told him. On the stand, John did something his father never would have done, publicly admit that he had been wrong. The young Rockefeller then promised to go to Ludlow himself and speak directly with the miners. 
as he was about to make his journey of atonement, his mother died. One of the first sympathy notes came from Mother Jones. In September 1915, Junior arrived in Ludlow. He refused to carry a weapon or have bodyguards. He sees the way in which miners lived. He sees how thin their children are. He understands that, that there is no potable drinking water in most of the camps. Uh, he, in fact, for someone with a reputation for immense rectitude and shyness, uh, comes out of himself. Preaching a gospel of cooperation and Christian brotherhood, Junior laid out a plan for a panel to address worker grievances. He also promised the miners they would not be fired if they chose to join a union instead. His approach worked. The miners voted for his plan in a secret ballot. The usually straight-laced junior took the hand of a miner's wife and gaily broke into a dance when a four-piece band struck up the hesitation waltz. John's rearing as this child who had to eat plain food and wear plain clothes and be a plain little kid, he knew how to conduct himself with miners and families who were living in tents and who were living in great deprivation. He ate the food they had. He, he, he sopped up the gravy with his bread. It's a wonderful portrait of a man who, as it turned out, you, you, you kind of see Laura Spelman over his shoulder, um, realizing that she brought good to this boy as well as repression. Selling the plan to CF&I management was not easy. Junior cashiered the Rockefeller agent on the scene. When his father's advisors protested, he brought in his own team. When the dust is settled, Junior is running the show. And his father, by his silence, says, go ahead. And it's at that point that he really becomes the master of the house. The senior hasn't transferred all the money to him. In fact, it's after he succeeds in minimizing the damage at Ludlow that senior begins transferring the enormous amounts of money to Junior's name. As a boy, Junior had learned the biblical saying that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He was deeply troubled by the image of his father as a robber baron. And John D. Jr. saw his life's mission as trying to remove the taint that uh, seemed to exist around the uh, Rockefeller wealth and the Rockefeller family and the Rockefeller name. Years before, Senior had been warned that his vast wealth, like an avalanche, could crush him and his children and his children's children. Now his son Junior faced that danger. As he drove himself mercilessly to redeem the family name, the weight of the Rockefeller fortune would threaten to overwhelm him. Lakewood, New Jersey, July 10th, 1918. Dear son, I am giving you 166,072 shares of the stock of the Standard Sun. Oil Company. Of I am today giving you $20,688,000 par value in bonds of the state of New York. Dear Sun, and corporate stock of the I city. am giving you a check for $500,000. It will be available for use on Monday next. By the early 1920s, John D. Rockefeller Sr. had turned over close to half a billion dollars to his son. 
and with it, a heavy responsibility, the stewardship of the great fortune. I am indeed blessed beyond measure to have a son whom I can trust to do this most important work. With tenderest affection, Father. John D. Jr. saw his life's mission as trying to remove the taint that uh, seemed to exist around the uh, Rockefeller wealth and in many ways through his philanthropy trying to finally justify the accumulation of this great fortune. <laughs> Whether restoring the Palace of Versailles, saving the giant redwoods in California, or founding a medical college in China, Junior was consumed by his work. Asked by a reporter where her husband was, Abby Rockefeller replied, I don't know where John is anymore. I'm sure he's out somewhere saving the world. He can invest in a profound way with this money, and he can, in some sense, be a, a titan in the same way that his father was. He invested in every avenue, medicine, science, education, the arts, foreign policy. The pressure proved too much for Junior. Very often, he would come home at the end of the day with a throbbing migraine headache, and he would lie down in the bedroom with a compress on his uh, forehead. He was really putting himself on the line in a courageous and personal fashion. His headaches became so incapacitating that he was forced to take a rest cure at Dr. Kellogg's Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan, where he was diagnosed with overexertion. While the son sacrificed himself to redeem the father, the father seemed remarkably at ease. Long away from business and free of the burden of his fortune, John D. Rockefeller, now in his mid-80s, settled into his retirement. In his old age, Senior showed the world a side of himself only those who knew him best had ever glimpsed as the former recluse played up to the movie cameras. Through the magic of public relations, John D. Rockefeller Sr. was transformed from a reviled robber baron into a genial old man, famous for dispensing dimes. Don't you give her a dime, Mr. Rockefeller? Oh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Every day, he appeared at the golf course at 12 past 12 to indulge in his favorite pastime. He's gay, he's lively, he's jaunty, he flirts with pretty young women, he loves to sing hymns and tell corny jokes and mimic people. He'd spend his mornings working on the stock market, and then he would go out and golf or ride around in a car in the afternoon, but always with women or children along. Everybody notices that he's fascinated with women. If he meets a, a group of pretty young women, he will invite them to play golf or come to lunch. One of his many rituals was that every afternoon at 3.15, he and eight to 10 other people would take a drive in the country. And John D. always sat in the middle of the back seat. And he preferred to have a buxom lady to his right and one to his left. He would um, then take a blanket and he would draw the blanket up to their chins. And then his hands would be strung underneath to the point where the back seat became known as the hot seat. And there is a recorded uh, episode of a young woman jumping out of the hot seat and telling the driver, that old rooster ought to be handcuffed. So he developed a reputation for these wandering hands. And this behavior to people who had known him earlier seemed completely out of character. As the first son and bearer of the family name, John D. Rockefeller III, a serious and introverted boy, was, from an early age, cast in the mold of dynastic heir. His grandfather would write him at his birthday and Christmas time and say things like, 
I look forward to when you can join your father in helping to carry the heavy burden and so on. So John grew up thinking that he had a very specific role that had been delimited for him. There was not an awful lot of choice for John. In 1929, fresh out of Princeton, John arrived at New York's most famous business address to take his assigned place helping his father run the family businesses and philanthropies. The debut of the world's richest heir attracted so much attention that Junior decided to hold a press conference. John comes in shy, reserved, uncertain. He's never done this kind of thing before and is questioned by all of the assembled New York City press corps. They were all barking questions at him and attempting to get underneath, and John progressively withdrew as the press conference went on. One of the uh, uh, reporters wrote about him sort of crossing his legs and trying to twist himself into a pretzel. He was tremendously uncomfortable with the attention, and I think began to view his role as this is very serious, I'm burdened, I'm afraid of making a mistake. And I think it was a very, very difficult moment in his life. At the end of the painful ordeal, John wrote in his diary, must get out of the papers for a long time now. In 1929, John D. Rockefeller Jr. was putting the final touches on the Riverside Church, a magnificent structure he had erected on Manhattan's Upper West Side. Built on a monumental scale, Riverside resembled Europe's great cathedrals, but only in its architecture. It certainly harks back to a Gothic cathedral, but as statues of saints and martyrs are placed around traditional cathedrals. There are statues of scientists and lawgivers. Uh, there's even a statue of Darwin in Riverside Church. Now, that's a statement. While he remained committed to the Christian faith of his mother and grandmother, Junior had come to believe that scientific progress was an expression of God's will and the means to create God's kingdom on earth. This is what Junior embodies, both the old and the new. The old revivalist impulse to reform the world and the new measures that are coming out of science and business. And so business-like efficiency and scientific research become the new means, the new tools for achieving the old reform crusades. Christian fundamentalists in the 1920s saw Junior's embrace of science as a rejection of the Bible's teachings. They worried that the richest man in the world was extending his influence into the religious realm. One preacher put it in apocalyptic terms. When one man can control the financial world, the educational world, and practically the religious world, the day of the Antichrist is not far behind. By now, the Rockefeller fortune was estimated at $1 billion, invested not only in the companies that once made up Standard Oil, but also in banking and in new industries. Armed with his vast wealth, Junior had become as formidable a philanthropist as his father had been a businessman. Sometimes, he even employed similar tactics. Father had this great love and joy in opening up wherever he was, whether it was Maine or Tarrytown or Wyoming, the beauty of nature so people could share. He took us on voyages to see America we were camping and building log cabins and riding horseback and we were hiking and then Nelson and I were avid photographers so we were taking pictures and looking for the best view wherever we went
During a family trip to Wyoming, Junior was awed by the majestic Teton Mountains. Their beauty, he said, surpassed anything he had ever beheld. What he saw below in the town of Jackson Hole dismayed him. He saw the honky-tonks and, and newsstands and so on that were being put in the view of the beautiful Teton Mountains and that persuaded him to buy the land and give that to what is now a part of Grand Teton National Park. Junior probably spent somewhere around $13 million in acquiring land around Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Initially, as did most of the Rockefellers, he bought that through a cover company. Nothing surprising. Anytime the Rockefeller name got involved, prices skyrocketed. Nothing illegal about it, though probably he got some um, extra special help from the Park Service identifying acreage. The way Junior acquired the Grand Tetons was a substantial use of power. And in that sense, the philanthropic impulse is not necessarily different from Standard Oil. Remember, Senior thought that Standard Oil was not just a profit-making corporation, but a way of making the world a better place. Junior's not-for-profit enterprises were not different in that regard. Like the independent refiners crushed by Standard Oil, local businessmen were outraged. He encountered tremendous opposition and uh, resentment. Uh, there were dude ranch operators and local cattlemen who felt that these were rich folks from back east who were throwing their weight around and trying to ruin their way of life. And they didn't see it as a gift. They saw it as this rich family that was pushing them around. And it was um, a protracted battle. is beautiful but it was developed in the way it was because junior thought that's the way it ought to be and he had the money and the contacts to make it happen for junior preservation provided an escape from a modern world which he found uncomfortable at Williamsburg he spent 55 million dollars to restore Virginia's colonial capital to an idealized version of the past. At the Cloisters, a museum on the northern tip of Manhattan, he created a medieval retreat and filled it with ancient treasures. Junior's interest in art went backwards. He was interested in older art, historical art, and certainly that is what the cloisters displays beautifully. But while Junior sought peace in the old, his wife, Abby, found excitement in the new. She was attracted by the unusual, adventurous, inner-directed art. She liked experimentation. She was open to new ideas. And also, she wanted to understand the art that her children would grow up to understand. In other words, she wanted to be a modern. Mother liked beauty wherever she found it, and she found it in many different places, both in nature and in contemporary art. And that's where they pretty much parted company. In 1939, after 10 years in a temporary home, the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, opened its doors. Just off Fifth Avenue, on a site long occupied by the old-fashioned town dwellings of the Rockefeller family, stands the spanking new home of a nationally important institution. Junior not only donated over $6 million, but had the Rockefeller home torn down to make room for the museum. In exchange, he extracted a promise. Abby made a bargain with Junior that they sell their property on 54th Street and move to an apartment. And he agreed to do it, provided she agreed to cut back most of her activities at MoMA. He was concerned about her health then, which was beginning to fail. And so she used that as a bargaining chip. 
For the Rockefellers, the Museum of Modern Art would always be known as Mother's Museum. If mother had a museum, father had a monument. Rockefeller Center will always be the place that the Rockefellers can point to. It's the physical embodiment of what their family accomplished. It's putting the family stamp right on the face of New York City and therefore on the face of America. It had been conceived in 1928 as yet another philanthropy, a new home for the Metropolitan Opera and development of the surrounding three-block area. But then the stock market crashed in 1929, ruining millions of investors and wiping out more than half of the Rockefeller fortune. Junior developed shingles, frequent severe colds. I walk the floors at night wondering where I'm going to get the money to build these buildings, he wrote. He stuck with a couple of rather substantial blocks of property. He has to pay lease payments on them. Uh, he has to pay property taxes on them. Uh, and this is the absolute rock bottom of the country's economic history. He can eat the loss, or he can do something which is really very, very risky. Junior had been humiliated by the failure of his first business venture 30 years before. Now, he rose to the challenge. He put up nearly one-third of his diminished fortune and gambled on the massive project. With 13 buildings surrounding a 70-story tower, Rockefeller Center was designed on an epic scale, described as a mixture of brashness and grandeur. Employing 75,000 workers, it was the only major construction project in New York City in the grim days of the Great Depression. And this is an act of faith in America. I think Americans were fascinated by the size, the magnitude, and the fact that this man, this family, believed that there was a future for the country. And uh, this great monument was, in effect, built for that. In what would become a yearly tradition, grateful workers lit the first Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center in 1933. In his vigorous old age, John D. Rockefeller spoke often of reaching a hundred years. He died on March 23, 1937, at his winter home in Ormond Beach, just two years short of his goal. To the end of his days, the King of Standard Oil, long vilified as monstrous, evil, cruel, believed that he was at peace with God. I've uh, carried this verse in my purse for so long I can't remember. It's a quote from my grandfather. I was early taught to work as well as play. My life has been one long happy holiday. Full of work and full of play, I dropped the worry on the way, and God was good to me every day. The funeral was held at Kaikit the symbolic seat of the Rockefeller family, and now Junior's home. All over the world, in every office, company, and refinery of the former Standard Oil Empire, work ceased for five minutes. Rockefeller Center, a city within a city, reaches completion after eight years of construction. Planned in boom times and built during the Depression, the center juts into the sky above the... In 1939, as he put the last rivet in Rockefeller Center, John D. Rockefeller Jr., now 65, could look back on a life of achievement. No man in America lived up to his ideals more than John D. Rockefeller Jr., said Ida Tarbell, 
the journalist whose expose of Standard Oil had so tarnished the family name. I know of no father that has given better guidance to his son than has John D. Rockefeller. By spreading his philanthropy as broadly as he did, Junior gave a very large number of people reasons to remember the Rockefellers that had nothing to do with Standard Oil, that had nothing to do with Ida Tarbell, but that had to do with beauty and nature and scientific progress. He succeeded to such an extent that by the time his own children reached adulthood in the 1930s, it was probably very difficult for them to imagine the firestorm of controversy that had surrounded the Rockefeller name only 30 years before. John D. Jr. has created this remarkable family, these five boisterous boys, and uh, all of them with great promise, but there is a kind of peril, and he sees it early on, and that is that they can undo with uh, careless gestures the work it has taken him 30 or 40 years to complete. Babs seemed to reject the family's mission of public service. Her brother Nelson was about to take it in a whole new direction. Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller ran for governor of New York, the office from which Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt had propelled themselves into the presidency of the United States. For a family that had repeatedly been hurt by public criticism, it was a step fraught with peril. My great-grandfather was attacked over an extended period of time by journalists, so in that sense, this was a dangerous, unpredictable world out there and the best thing to do was stay away from it, not provoke it. I think Nelson's own very extrovert personality and then going into politics brought the family more into the public eye than they'd ever been really comfortable with before um, and created some tension in the family because if one person goes public to that extent in a certain sense, they bring everybody else with them. The brothers put aside their apprehensions and backed Nelson's entry into politics. The brothers all collaborate in his first political campaign. They all contribute. John D. III is a little reluctant, but, uh, you know, who is he, really? He's the bypassed first son, you know? What, how can he prescribe policy for this, for this generation? So there's a sense that uh, they had come so far, why not go the extra step, which is the step that leads them to the White House. In his race for the Republican nomination for governor, Nelson Rockefeller ran against a conservative, Walter Mahoney. I remember Walter Mahoney saying to me early on, the one thing I cannot gauge is the effect of big wealth when it is brought to bear. And he was right uh, on the mark when he said that, because uh, we found out that of uh, New York's 60-plus uh, counties, practically all of them, uh, in practically all of them, the, the county chairman was either the president of the local bank or the lawyer for the president of the local bank, and all of the local banks had affiliations with Chase Manhattan. And there was just no stopping Rockefeller. He rolled over us uh, with no trouble at all. Republican nominee would go on to oppose the incumbent Democratic governor, Averill Harriman. A patrician, heir to one of the nation's largest railroad fortunes, Harriman could match Nelson Rockefeller's resources, but not his personality. Mr. Rockefeller, what's yeah. that in the package? I got a wonderful piece of salami. After they got all the pictures in there, I said, well, what I'd come in was to get the salami, not the pictures, so I had to finish my purchase. The chef and the cook gave me some uh, delicious food to eat, uh, uh, gefilte fish with uh, horseradish, and then uh, lunch with... Uh, lunch with uh... He discovered that he thoroughly enjoyed politics, 
being out in the, on the hustings with people. We love the give and take of dialogue with people on the street and uh, you know in restaurants and all sorts of different situations. The people reacting to him would start the adrenaline flowing and the big grin would come out and he would start slapping the backs and pumping the flesh and giving people his trademark, hi you fella, and he would clearly enjoy it. As the 1958 gubernatorial campaign wound down, Rockefeller had traveled 8,500 miles, delivered more than 100 speeches, and spent as much as $4 million, more than any candidate running for state office ever had. At a GOP campaign headquarters in New York City, it's Nelson A. Rockefeller, who is the Empire State's governor-elect, a winner by 560,000 votes over Abraham Harriman, seeking a second term. For John D. Rockefeller, Jr., now a frail 84 years old, Nelson's victory was the vindication of his lifelong mission to redeem the family name. The fact that Nelson had been elected was a sign to him that the people of uh, the United States had, in fact, uh, fully accepted the Rockefellers in spite of the early history of the family. Nelson Rockefeller had done something that no other Rockefeller had ever done. He had gone public. He had won the affirmation and the mandate of the people. And that meant as much to him personally as it did politically. On May 7, 1960, at age 86, John D. Rockefeller Jr. died during his winter stay in Tucson, Arizona. The funeral was held in New York City at the Riverside Church, the Gothic Cathedral Jr. had built. By the time of his death, Junior, who had given away more than half a billion dollars, was regarded as one of the world's foremost philanthropists. To his children and 22 grandchildren, he was leaving an invaluable inheritance, a name which stood not for corporate greed, but for the well-being of mankind. Nelson rushed to fill the void his father's death had created. Less than a year after Junior's death, he moved into Kaikit, the mansion at Pocantico Hills his father had built for his grandfather. The many modern sculptures he added to his father's classical statuary and imposed on his grandfather's stately landscapes underscored that he was the new lord of Kaikit. In November 1962, Nelson Rockefeller was re-elected governor of New York in a landslide. The popular governor of the nation's most populous state, Nelson had a golden opportunity to gain the Republican nomination for president. As the 1964 presidential elections approached, opinion polls showed Rockefeller holding a commanding 17-point lead over his closest rival, the Republican senator from Arizona, Barry Goldwater. Most observers regarded Nelson's nomination for the presidency in 1964 a foregone conclusion. Then, in the months before the Republican primaries, there was talk of a woman in Rockefeller's life. There is a strong rumor around today, Governor, that you are going to announce your personal plans for the future. No comment. No comment. <laughs> Couldn't identify the questioner. No comment. <laughs> the marriage took place in Pocantico on May 4th, 1963. The bride was Margareta Happy Murphy, recently divorced and the mother of four children. Lawrence hosted the wedding. Neither Nelson's children nor his other siblings attended. Earlier 
in the week, Winthrop had come all the way from Arkansas to try to dissuade Nelson from marrying. That very weekend, John D. III entertained Nelson's ex-wife, Todd, at his home in Williamsburg. I think it would be inaccurate to say that it didn't create problems for him, both politically and within the family. I think that uh, um, his political career um, started to come to an end uh, at the time of his divorce and remarriage. My great honor and pleasure to introduce to you someone that some of you have been looking for for quite a while, Mrs. Rockefeller. Nelson, at this point, really knows no bounds. He is, you know, he is uh, writing the updrafts of this amazing thing that has happened with the family in the post-war era and figures, you know, he can have it all. These were uh, much more uh, conservative times socially in this country. He was warned that this was a, a very perilous thing for him to do in, in light of his still burning of, uh, political ambitions. He went ahead with it anyway. For weeks, the Rockefeller name was splashed across the national press. Nelson was called a homewrecker. His new wife was accused of abandoning her young children. By late May, his lead over Goldwater had vanished. A pundit who only weeks earlier had been certain of Nelson's nomination now said his chances were worth little more than a plug nickel. On July 16th, at the San Francisco Cow Palace, Barry Goldwater was nominated in the first ballot. I will remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. The runner-up, Nelson Rockefeller, was given five minutes to address the convention. May we have order? May we, may we have order? May we have order so that the can be heard? The mostly hostile crowd Governor Nelson Rockefeller addressed that day was no longer his Republican Party. May we have order so that the can be heard? Present, probably for the first time in any significant number in a Republican convention, was a strong, conservative, populist uh, force of people, what today I think we would identify, at least in part, as the Christian coalition, who were in open rebellion against the, the so-called liberal Republican Party. During this year, I have crisscrossed this nation, fighting for these principles fighting to keep the Republican Party the party of all the people. And warning of the extremist threat, its danger to the party. No matter how long and hard they jeered and shouted, he kept watching his, his time, and he said, I'll stay here until I get my five minutes. The five minutes endured for 15 minutes. That was a shining moment. Nelson Rockefeller standing up courageously, taking uh, the hoots and hollers of the crowd and refusing to bend. Nelson Rockefeller returned home to Kaikit. Surrounded by his beloved art collection and the affection of his new family, he settled down to the business of running the state of New York. Spending taxpayers' money as freely as if it were his own, he embarked on a massive building spree which would transform the Empire State. Miles and miles of highways, hundreds of water treatment plants, 50 new state parks. 
who like nothing better than to see the dirt fly. That's why he built this huge university system. He built the new capital, known today as the Nelson A. Rockefeller Empire State Plaza. Here was something tangible that you could put your hands on, that you could see, that would long outlast his own life. As Rockefeller became absorbed in remaking New York State, his presidential virus seemed to be in remission. I believe Rocky when he says he's lost his presidential ambition, journalist Bill Moyers commented. I also believe he remembers where he put it. In August 1968, Nelson Rockefeller went to Miami Beach to seek the Republican nomination for the third time. There, his dream of reaching the White House effectively came to an end. It was fated. It was mathematically impossible. It was in the cards. It was in the stars that he wasn't going to get elected president or nominated uh, to be president because he was not, he was a Republican and he was the wrong kind of Republican. I, I, I don't mean to be uncharitable about that, but that's just the, that's just the way it was. The end of Nelson's presidential hopes denied the grandchildren of John D. Rockefeller the final prize in their ascent to the pinnacle of American society. But as they gathered in New York to be honored for their commitment to philanthropy, the Rockefeller brothers remained at the center of American life. From real estate in Manhattan to fishing docks in Venezuela, their holdings were vast and diverse. At a time when America was growing suspicious of wealth and power, the brothers had achieved a dangerous visibility. John D. III was a valued expert on Asian affairs. Lawrence was a leader in the field of conservation. David, now president of the Chase Manhattan Bank, was an ambassador for world capitalism. Even Winthrop had become a public figure. In 1966, he had been elected governor of Arkansas, the first Republican in 100 years. The success of Winrock Farms, his commitment to Arkansas development, and his name had made him an irresistible candidate in the poor southern state. For this with the common touch, the prodigal son, the odd man out in the family. His election as governor meant much more than a political victory. If I can do something to correct some of these things and I can get people as mad and excited as I am, then I feel that my late mother and father would be proud of me. <laughs> Babs, too, would have made her father proud. Waiting until Junior's death to join her brothers as a philanthropist, she had become deeply involved in the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And in 1971, she donated Greenacre Park, a pastoral retreat in mid-Manhattan. All five brothers attended the park's dedication, the last time they would all be together in public. February 1973, the Rockefeller family gathered at Petty Jean Mountain in Arkansas for the funeral of Winthrop, who had died of cancer at age 61. My memory goes back over the years when we were children. The games, the chores, the rough houses, the fights, but always in the last analysis, a united family. Winthrop was the first Rockefeller in the third generation to pass away. Babs would die three years later, also of cancer. 
Their deaths signaled the beginning of a painful transition to a new generation. The cousins found that they could no longer uncritically simply accept their role as being Rockefellers. Most of us went into our 20s in the 1960s. So we were caught up in a social environment that involved the civil rights movement and the women's movement, the anti-war movement. And if you took seriously these social movements, which all of us did because we, in a sense, had been brought up to be morally concerned, socially concerned, then you had to question the history of the family in your own identity. A remarkable number of them want to change their family's name. They want to not be Rockefellers anymore. They want to, in the case of the, of the uh, young women of the fourth generation, they want to take their mother's maiden name. They want to give away the money. They want to go live on a reservation. They want to go live in a boxcar someplace. They want out. They want out of that family. It was the radical student left days. And in many ways, the name Rockefeller symbolized the establishment and what the student movement was about was anti-establishment. There's no question that I felt the tension of being involved in a movement which was using my family name as a symbol, and yet that was my name. I mean, that couldn't but create tension within me, and it did. It was Nelson Rockefeller who turned left-wing animosity toward the family into rage. In September 1971, he ordered 1,000 New York State troopers into the Attica State Prison to put down an inmate revolt. For four anxious days, the nation was transfixed by images of 1,300 inmates barricaded inside Attica and the 38 prison guards they held hostage. The inmates demanded better living conditions and a general amnesty for the takeover. On the fifth day of the siege, they rejected a last appeal and threatened to kill the hostages. The governor, who had monitored the crisis from his home in Kaiki, resolved to act. It was the bloodiest prison takeover in American history. Police and prison security gunfire killed 29 inmates and 10 hostages in less than six minutes. Nelson Rockefeller, the man who ordered the prison retaken, was held accountable. Not since John D. Rockefeller Jr. was called a murderer after the Ludlow massacre in 1914 had a Rockefeller faced so much hostility. Brown prisoners, Governor. How many guards did you kill? I have decided not to seek a fifth term as governor of New York. I will resign next Tuesday after 15 years of service to the people of the state. On December 11th, 1973, Nelson Rockefeller weary of controversy, retreated from public life. The following summer, as he vacationed in Maine, the former governor received a telephone call that would drag the Rockefellers back into the glare of public scrutiny. It was August 17, 1974, two weeks since President Richard Nixon resigned in disgrace in the wake of Watergate. The new president, Gerald Ford, asked Nelson Rockefeller to be his vice president. The last thing that Nelson Rockefeller ever wanted to be was vice president of anything, to be standby equipment. Uh, he was not temperamentally suited for it. He was a man who wanted to be in charge. The country was in the midst of a crisis, and how could you say no when your president turns to you? But there was a more practical reason as well. He had behind him three failed bids uh, as a candidate for his party's presidential nomination. And this was the last game in town for him. This was the last card he could play. 
Nelson arrived in Washington eager to begin his new job. He expected his confirmation hearings to be a mere formality. They were not. I have held public office under six presidents. I've been elected four times and served for 15 years as the governor of the state of New York. I think the record speaks for itself. Initially, Let's the hearings remember, focused on Nelson Rockefeller. Back taxes owed, personal time gifts time to associates and friends, sale, and a covert operation system. where Lawrence financed yes. a book critical of one of Nelson's political opponents. But far and away, the issue that most interested Congress was Nelson Rockefeller's place as a member of what was thought to be America's wealthiest family. Am I the kind of man who would use his wealth improperly in public office? Or, more generally and more importantly, would my family background somehow limit and blind me so that I would not be able to see and serve the general good of all Americans? It's really a relationship between money and power. How far do we trust individuals with great financial uh, resources with the governance of a democratic society? There's been this notion of Rockefeller power that has been bandied about by the new left and um, over a five or, or a ten year period uh, to the degree that it's kind of penetrated in some sense popular culture. And so when he comes finally for his uh, crucial moment for his uh, interrogation, there's a sense, okay, we're going to get a chance to see this power at last. This power that's been hidden for two generations now and the power in the form of money. The committee asked Nelson to disclose not only his own finances, but those of the entire family. And I said, look, Governor, this is a, a major invasion of privacy. This is the occasion, if you want out of this process, this is the event that I think you can say you can take this job and you know what you can do with it. And I said, this is, this is the time to exit. And he looked at me and he said, no, he said, uh, he said, I'm going to go through with this. Not since Lady Godiva rode naked through the streets of Coventry, wrote the New York Times, have the inhabitants of any town itched to see something hidden, as people here now desire to see the extent of the Rockefeller fortune. Speculation was rampant. Estimates of the Rockefeller's financial holdings ranged from $5 billion to $60 billion. They do recognize that questions have been raised as to whether the financial holdings of this family or the manner in which they are managed present a conflict of interest. Or Nelson's vice presidential hearings exploded the myth of the Rockefellers as a family of enormous wealth. Their combined worth was revealed to be $1.3 billion, far below the most conservative estimates. Yet, as one observer noted, the point was not that they lacked power, but that their power lay elsewhere, in their connections in business, politics, and world affairs, and the mystique of the Rockefeller name. The Vice President-designate of the United States. On December 19, 1974, Nelson Rockefeller was sworn in. For a job he'd once dismissed as standby equipment, he paid a huge price. Some of the brothers were concerned that Nelson had brought publicity to the family that was not necessary, that questioning the, the motives and impugning the integrity of family members and its institutions uh, was simply wrong, and that he had sacrificed the good name of these institutions and their reputation for his own political career. Nelson's tenure was frustrating and short-lived. In November 1975, as Gerald Ford prepared to campaign for president, he dropped Nelson Rockefeller from the ticket under pressure from the Republican right wing. I understand all of the reasons why these different things happen. And you get yeah, why burn up energy uh, on getting upset? He went back home to New York 
never gave another dime to the Republican Party, never made another speech on behalf of anybody in the party. His turning his back on, on public life, uh, to me, seemed to mark uh, a, a real change of direction. It had meant so much to him before. In his retirement, Nelson Rockefeller reminded his speechwriter of The Old King, a painting by French master Georges Rouveau. The eyes bare slits, the chin firmly set in an ancient defiance, as remote as a lost planet. In Nelson's case, a prince who had grown old and who had never inherited the kingdom. Nelson Rockefeller returned to the family offices, expecting yet again to take the reins of the Rockefeller family. The brothers had always stepped aside for Nelson, but this time John D. III, the bypassed older brother, the one most disturbed by the way Nelson's ambition had exposed the family, finally stood up to retake his dynastic place. They had had a number of arguments uh, in brothers' meetings John said that uh, you told me a long time ago that there were two things that you wanted to above all things. You wanted to be president of the United States and you wanted to be the leader of the Rockefeller family. You have failed in your first objective and if you don't mend your ways, you will fail in your second objective. And by the summer of 1977, John and Nelson we're not talking to one another. John D. III and Nelson never had an opportunity to reconcile. John died in a car accident near his home in Pocantico in July 1978. His brother, Nelson, survived him by only six months. Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller was buried at the northwest corner of Pocantico, near the golf course where John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil and maker of the great fortune, had played. The Gardens Jr., the philanthropist who redeemed the family name, had cherished. The sculptures that Nelson himself, the third and final lord of Kaikat, had so boldly placed. For a century, the Rockefellers occupied a unique place as one of America's most influential and controversial families. Three generations had left their mark on history. It would fall to a fourth to find a way forward. Why do we want to preserve this power? Why do we want to devote our lives to maintaining all these institutions that have been created by the family? we came to realize that the real problem is the integration of power and goodness. And that if the family was going to continue uh, to work together, uh, philanthropic commitments and values would be at the uh, center. Everyone recognizes that not anyone, and even not all of us, can do everything, obviously. But I think each of us has a drive to contribute in some way to that mission. It's a family which is very much trying to continue uh, uh, some traditions at the same time starting others. It remains to be seen how well we do. And this turned relations between John Dee and his father stone cold. I think in the long run, 
it had the effect of leading John Dee to decide to make a life for himself that was as different from his father's as he could manage without quite abandoning things that he still thought of value in what his father had taught him, like business. John had hoped to go to college. Now he dropped out of high school and started looking for work to help support the family. I did not go to any small establishments, he recalled. I was after something big. He found a job as an assistant bookkeeper, but threw himself into it with missionary intensity. As soon as he starts working, there's nothing lighthearted or carefree about this young 16-year-old boy. He closely reviews every bill and uh, jumps on errors of even a few pennies in the bill. He's amazed at the laxity and inefficiency of these much older bosses who are much more experienced. And I think that that was the thing that distinguished Rockefeller from an early age. Not so much brilliant, flashing intelligence, but this thorough, plodding, systematic way that he did things. John began to keep a ledger, noting every expenditure, large and small. For him, numbers were sacred. John Dee's ledger took on a special role of being a kind of conscience, I would say. He recorded his contributions to various causes, to church, every penny that he gave to a poor little girl he saw on the street, to abolitionist causes. And he would use this throughout his life as a way of evaluating himself. Line upon line, as his earnings grew, his ambition quickened. He borrowed $1,000 from Devil Bill, with interest, and plunged into the risky business of commodity trading, buying and selling meat and grain. He was just 18. Only a year later, the something big he was looking for surfaced in the backwoods of Pennsylvania. Oil, to grease the wheels of America's infant industries. Oil, to fuel an explosion of growth. News of the discovery unleashed pandemonium as thousands of speculators descended upon the region. Overnight, wildcatters stripped away whole forests and put up thousands of rickety derricks, hoping to strike black gold. As the oil gushed skyward, fantastic stories appeared of instant fortunes. Among the Cleveland businessmen lured to was John D. Rockefeller. He was no wildcatter. He saw that drilling for oil was a very risky business. Refining, not drilling, he decided, was where the steady money was to be made. Soon, a new rail line linked Cleveland with the oil region. Rockefeller built his refinery right beside it. It was one of the first in the city to produce kerosene, a new fuel for lamps that was cheap and clean. The poor man's light, as John Dee called it, would bring a brilliant glow into American homes. The soaring demand for it, he was convinced, would make him rich. I shall never forget how hungry I was in those days, he later wrote. I ran up and down the tops of freight cars. I hurried up the boys. Obsessed with the business of oil, he mastered every detail, developed new products to sell. By age 25, his refinery was one of the largest in the world. He really mortgaged his life. He once appeared with a patchwork tablecloth made out of banknotes. I had a peculiar training in my home. John Dee observed of his childhood. It seemed to be a business training from the beginning. 
Bill Rockefeller admitted to one of his neighbors, I do business deals with my sons and I always try to cheat them, to make them sharp. Now, John D. did not always like those lessons in business, but he absorbed them. His father lent him money, always at the prevailing interest rate, then deliberately called in the loans without warning to make sure his son had kept reserves. With Devil Bill, John D. discovered the excitement of taking a big risk, the allure of cold cash. Eliza taught him the sober habits of her Christian faith, thrift, hard work, and perfect self-control. He was like a little adult. When he went to school, students talked about him being Mr. Serious. And although he had a wonderful sense of humor that was very sly, for the most part, he behaved very uh, rigidly even and, and liked things orderly the way his mother did. Things occurred according to schedules. And there was a reward for good behavior and there was a sacrifice for bad behavior. In 1849, the world fell apart for the Rockefeller family. Bill was accused of the rape of a maid he had hired to work in the household. Rather than confront the charges, he fled, leaving the family alone to face the scandal. It was a moment of intense shame for 10-year-old John. And I think that it was in the face of the malicious tongues of village gossips that uh, John D. Rockefeller developed this very wary, secretive, self-reliant uh, nature because people were always whispering about his father and John D. himself would not have known the truth of his father but I think that he felt that he would face down the village gossips by developing this very hard and stoic air. Eliza and her five children found refuge in the local Baptist church. Each Sunday, when the collection plate was passed around, she urged young John to contribute his few pennies. He came to associate the church with charity. A Baptist preacher once encouraged him to make as much money as he could, then give away as much as he could. It was at this moment, Rockefeller later recalled, that the financial plan of my life was formed. But the sound of coins in the collection plate still had the distant ring of Devil Bill. John D. came to associate money with those rare times that father came home flush with cash from the, the road and that the Rockefellers briefly functioned as a real family. And I think the fact that John D. grew up in this perpetually insecure situation, wondering whether, when father would come home, wondering if they would pay off the credit at the, uh, the general store, created a person who had an abnormal need, not only for a large amount of money, but for constant security. And somebody who disliked surprises, somebody who wanted to master chance and outwit fate. Fate delivered John Dee one more bitter surprise. He soon discovered that his father had taken a second wife under an assumed name. Shielding his mother from the shame, John kept the bigamy a secret. To carry on his double life, Bill moved the family to Cleveland. Then he disappeared again, leaving them alone in the new city. They feared the temptations of wealth, yet a visitor once described their estate as the kind of place God would have built, if only he'd had the money. They amassed a fortune that outraged a democratic nation, then gave it away, reshaping America. 
They were the closest thing the country had to a royal family. But the Rockefellers shunned the public eye, retreating behind the walls of their palatial home at Pocantico, New York. My own personal experience as a child is of a place that on the one hand was something of an Eden, it was serene and beautiful. As we grew up, a number of us began to experience Pocantico also as something of a prison that cut us off from the larger world. The family found themselves haunted by the controversy surrounding John D. Rockefeller, king of Standard Oil. Vilified as a ruthless predator, as evil incarnate, he had created an industrial empire and a personal fortune on a scale the world had never known. The great drama for the Rockefellers is to deal with the wealth, to deal with it as a physical fact, to deal with this, this fortune as growing day by day in a way they can't control anymore. But also they have to deal with the fact of this money as a moral fact. How do you control it? How do you control yourself? In the drama of the Rockefellers, John D. Jr. was cast in an almost impossible role. He was the son of the most controversial businessman in America who had to figure out, by sheer force of character, a way to change the image and the direction of this family without openly repudiating this father he loved. In his quest for redemption and respectability, John D. Jr. would push his family to the pinnacle of American power. One of his sons would reach for the highest prize, the presidency, and provoke a new generation's rage and hostility. More than a century, the Rockefellers' wealth and influence have attracted both attention and suspicion, and threatened to tear the family apart. Why do we want to preserve this power? Why do we want to devote our lives to maintaining all these institutions that have been created by the family? Uh, what is the purpose of all of this? And I think for many of us, we came to realize that the real problem of life is the integration of power and goodness. October 9th, 1901, the steam yacht Wild Duck sailed out of Providence, Rhode Island. On board was one of the richest men in America, John D. Rockefeller and his family. The boat was bound for an estate at Warwick Neck on the west shore of Narragansett Bay. Soon the groomed lawns would welcome 500 guests, the lions of the Gilded Age. Outside the gates, reporters gathered for the wedding of Rockefeller's only son, John Jr., and Abby Aldrich, daughter of a powerful Rhode Island senator. Pinkerton guards had been deployed to protect the bejeweled guests and glittering wedding presents. They had another more dangerous assignment. 
John D. Rockefeller, founder of Standard Oil, was the most hated man in America, described as monstrous, evil, cruel. Rockefeller was hounded by reporters, stalked by strangers asking for money. He had taken to keeping a revolver by his bed. There had been kidnap threats against his family and letters warning of homemade bombs destined for the Rockefeller's house. This was a family under siege. It would fall to the new bride and to the dutiful, obedient son, already oppressed by the burdens of growing up a Rockefeller, to find a way forward for the family. century they called this part of upstate New York the burned over district burned not by fire but by fire and brimstone by the blaze of Christian revivalism preachers urged a life of hard work prayer and good deeds to build the kingdom of God on earth it was in the midst of this evangelical fervor that John Davison Rockefeller was born in 1839, the second of five children. His mother, Eliza Davison Rockefeller, was deeply religious, stern, disciplined. Even as a young woman, she had not been given to smiles and laughter. But she had this fatal moment of weakness one day when William Avery Rockefeller appeared on her doorstep peddling cheap trinkets. And he had a little slate that was uh, tied to his buttonhole. And on the slate, he had chalked, I am deaf and dumb. This was part of his con man routine. And Eliza, quite out of character, was immediately smitten by this charming rascal and, in fact, proclaimed in his presence, I'd marry him if he weren't deaf and dumb. He's a scoundrel apparently an enchanting scoundrel in person and he certainly enchanted Eliza and apparently enchanted a good many other women too which is part of being a scoundrel unlike his devout wife William Avery Rockefeller kept away from the church he was a traveling man a salesman who sold quack cures from a wagon out on the western frontier People whispered about his footloose life. They called him Devil Bill. He would come and go as he pleased, never with advanced warning. He'd be away for months. There'd be credit at the store. One winter, he ran up a bill in one store of $1,000. In the 19th century, that's an enormous sum of money. But then he would come back, most frequently at night, so people would never know where he came from and he would tell stories of his exploits that were never quite complete enough to pin him down as to what he had done or where he had done it. Devil Bill's laughter and music flooded the house. He would be fingering wads of cash, wearing fancy new clothes. Up to the hilt, he borrowed tens of thousands of dollars, which is the equivalent, of course, of millions today. He had the strength of this vision that this was where his destiny was, and this is where the destiny of this country was. The country was going to kind of ride to, to greatness on this tidal wave of oil. And he constantly felt that he would inevitably triumph in some fundamental way. He honestly believed that he had a calling to make money and that it was a gift that had been bestowed upon him by God, just as some people could sing opera and other people could paint beautifully. He had a particular aptitude for acquiring wealth, and he considered it a God-given gift.
John Dee tended his faith as carefully as his business. As a lowly clerk, he paid for a slave's freedom and gave to a Catholic orphanage. As he grew rich, his donations grew more generous, especially for his church in Cleveland. He falls in love with this church. He sweeps the chapel. He rings the bell. He lights the candles. He teaches in the Sunday school. He seems to find in the church a refuge from the sort of sin that he has encountered with his father. Soon, John was drawn to a young woman as devout and determined as he was. Laura Spellman was an 1840s, 1850s feminist. She was the valedictorian of her high school graduating class, uh, the same class that John Dee was in. Uh, and the title of her address was, I Can Paddle My Own Canoe. And it was a plea for women's suffrage in 1855. When John courted her, it was very different from the other young men of her set who were also after her, who would see her at balls and parties. He'd come to her house, and they might play a little piano together, but then they would often sit down with his ledger books and go over them together. And she apparently found them just as interesting as he did. On September 8th, 1864, John and Laura were married in a small private ceremony. My great-grandmother was a figure who perhaps had a bit of hell and brimstone in her philosophy, who basically believed through deeds you go to heaven, uh, and therefore you could very likely go to hell if you weren't uh, properly motivated and, 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 and properly achieving. Like his devout mother, Laura strengthened John's sense that he was doing God's work, not only in church, but also in business. Rockefeller's future, however, was harnessed to an industry in trouble. So many wells were flowing, he lamented, that the price of oil kept falling, yet they went right on drilling. He saw an industry plagued by overproduction, and his own success threatened by what he described as ruinous cutthroat competition. John Dee was shrewd enough and he was analytical enough that he realized that in order to figure out a way to save his own firm and his own newly won fortune, that he had to figure out a solution for the entire industry. It was at that point that John Dee began to conceive of the oil industry as one big interrelated mechanism. And you couldn't just change one component. You had to control the entire machine. In a move that would transform the American economy, Rockefeller set out to replace a world of independent oil men with a giant company controlled by him. In 1870, begging bankers for more loans, he formed Standard Oil of Ohio. The next year, he quietly put what he called our plan, his campaign to dominate the volatile oil industry, into devastating effect. Rockefeller knew that the